So he had been working on his my fitness pal app and like programming like all the stuff he eats and i just started going through them and i was like trying to figure out like where his ratios were and we actually spent a lot of time doing that because he'd asked me to remember this is a response to what they talked about at the lazy dog this has been going on for like a minute now if someone tries to do this to you let them talk let them ramble but you need to circle back that's great he was trying to lose weight. It's great you helped him with his My Fitness app. But that doesn't tell me what you talked about at the Lazy Dog that night. So besides macronutrients, and she hasn't even said that's what they were talking about. She hasn't even said this was actually their discussion. So besides macronutrients, what else did you two talk about at Lazy Dog? Did Nicole Kessinger assist in or know about Chris's grisly crimes? I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. In today's video, we'll analyze Nicole Kessinger's interview with authorities to determine if she had guilty knowledge. This is the third video in my Nicole Kessinger series. In parts one and two, we've already caught her in some lies. We've also seen some mistakes that the interviewers made with her, and we've had a glimpse into her relationship with Chris. I believe she applied immense pressure to him to leave his family. However, all that said, I am not convinced that she assisted him in planning, executing, or covering up his crimes, although I am open to the possibility because she did delete all of her text messages with Chris before coming to the police to cooperate. In my world, that means you forfeit your right to the benefit of the doubt. With all this in mind, we'll consider these points as we listen to Nicole's interview. Because I was like, the way he made this sound, it wasn't, oh, she's this horrible person, or oh, I'm this horrible person. It was her and I have drifted so far apart that it's kind of a mutual agreement that this is not going to work. So in those six years, though, they had two children. Yep. Um, and you said earlier you did not know she was pregnant until reading the newspaper. Yep. So um, that never came up in any conversation. Um, there was no no indications that that was going on. None. Um, he never hinted to anything Nothing. like that. As far as you knew, um, he was just leaving her. He had two children, and um, that was the final take on that. Yes. Okay. I think... All right. So as I pointed out in my first part of this series, how to interrogate a suspect, I believe that the interrogators here did a very bad job at getting to the truth. And I don't know if they did that because they thought, hey, we've got Chris. At this point, I think he'd already confessed to the murders. And they're thinking, hey, let's just, you know, he probably did it, whether or not she encouraged him or not. We need to keep her credibility as a witness in case we need her to testify against him. I don't know why they went so soft on her. In part one, I gave them the benefit of the doubt, even though I pointed out some mistakes that they made. But by this point, I've analyzed about maybe 40 minutes of this interview, and the softness doesn't seem to be leading to some sort of overarching strategy. It really looks like sloppy detective work. So the question here that he's been trying to figure out, and also people in my DD forum have been asking, and positing their own theories. Did Nicole know that Shanann was pregnant before she claims to have known? In other words, let's, did she know about it a week before the murders or a month before the murders or at a point in time before the murders where it would have led to a furious fight, for example, between her and Chris in which she said, you need to get rid of that baby if you're going to be with me. Or you need to get rid of your family permanently if you're going to be with me. <coughs> so I'm not saying that's what happened, but I'm saying that's why the baby question is so important. And the way the detective has phrased these questions does not get us any closer to the truth. And I'm going to point out the mistakes he made so you can avoid them in your own life if you ever have to interview someone. So I'm going to rewind. Listen closely. It's not going to work. So in those six years, though, they had two children. Yep. Um, and you said earlier you did not know she was pregnant until reading the newspaper. Yep. 
You said earlier you did not know she was pregnant until reading the newspaper. What is wrong with that question? Why does it not get us to the truth? Well, Nicole answered, yep. If Nicole had known Shanann was pregnant a month prior, could she answer that question in the affirmative and pass a polygraph and be telling the complete truth so she doesn't even feel the stress of having to lie? Yes, she could. Because he's asking her if she told him earlier uh, that she found out about the pregnancy in the newspaper. What is he really asking? He's asking her to confirm whether or not she said something. So if she had told him, hey, I've been to the moon and it tastes like cheese, he could ask her, earlier you told me you've been to the moon and it tastes like cheese. Is that correct? Yes. She could pass the polygraph. Does it mean she's been to the moon and tasted it and it tastes like Gouda? Of course not. That is a giant rookie interview faux pas. And it's not the first mistake we've seen this guy make. So I encourage you to watch my entire Nicole Kessinger series after this one, if this is your first video in the series. Now let's look at the other errors he makes. So the first error is asking a question that is not specific enough to actually get you the truth. Yep. So um, that never came up in any conversation. That never came up in any conversation. What is wrong with that question? It's a loaded question. So for example, if, if uh, you stole my sandwich out of my fridge, or if I suspect you did, and I say, you never took this, my sandwich out of the office fridge, right? And you say, never, you're just parroting a word that was in my question, which is very easy to do under the stress of a lie. The proper way to ask a question is, do you know what happened to my sandwich? Have you seen my sandwich? Did you take my sandwich? And a question that is not loaded with the response. So he's asking these follow-up questions in the negative, which is interesting because it's almost as if he wants her to answer in the negative so they can move on. In other words, all the errors he, he's made so far in these interviews all point in one direction towards feeding her answers to not be a suspect. And it could simply be that, hey, we've got our guy. He confessed. I think he already confessed at this point. So, you know, let's not waste too much effort on this girl. We know she wasn't involved in the actual murders based on the evidence we have. He gave a full confession. So, you know, let's, uh, let's just go easy. Let's not dig up too much about this girl. I really don't know what they were thinking. That's just a guess at this point. But when all the mistakes that someone makes point in one direction – it usually indicates that the mistakes are deliberate. When someone's actually incompetent or sloppy, mistakes can go in all directions. It's kind of like if you go to a store and the cashier always gives you incorrect change, but it always benefits them. They always give you not quite enough change. Well, it kind of suggests that they might be better at math than you think. It might not all just be innocent errors. So listen again. How to how never is in the question itself. It's called a loaded question. Interviewers should never do that. Yep. Um, and you said earlier you did not know she was pregnant until reading the newspaper. Yep. So um, that never came up in any conversation. Um, there was no, no indications that that was going on. That never came up in any conversation. Never is in the question. There was never an indication, or there was no indication, or whatever he just said. The no, the negative response is in the question itself. Also, I don't think it's a coincidence that Nicole said never. Right? She literally parroted the word from the question, which if someone's being interrogated and they're going to lie, is the way they will do it. They will parrot back words. On. Um, he never hinted to anything Nothing. like that. As far as you knew, um, he was just leaving her. He had two children, and um, that was the final take on that. Yes. Okay. I think right, so as far as you knew, he was leaving her. The other error that this guy is making here is all of his questions 
restrict her. So it's all about, did he tell you Shanann was pregnant? Did he indicate Shanann was pregnant? Did he do anything other than indicate to you that he was leaving Shanann? What did the interviewer fail to ask her? He failed to ask her, did you think Shanann was pregnant? Did you do any research on your own to determine if Shanann was pregnant? Did you know Shanann was pregnant? So he never actually asks about her knowledge. He asks her questions about knowledge getting to her all in the negative. And then at the beginning, he asked her a question of whether or not she said something. This is almost like a catalog of interviewing mistakes all around the pregnancy. So to answer Hazak Q in the uh, DD forum, did Nicole know about the baby before, about the pregnancy, before she said she did? It's hard to tell. She could be telling the truth here or she could be lying. The way the questions were phrased were literally phrased in the worst way possible for us to deduce the truth. So, whether or not Nicole is innocent or guilty, if she was actually innocent, these investigators did a huge disservice to her by asking questions that were so weak that they don't let us assess the veracity of her answers because the questions themselves are so limited in scope and so loaded and so poorly worded that even if she was telling us the truth and answering them all honestly, it doesn't help us know... Um, her, her innocence, because they're so limited. Also, if she's guilty, they did a big disservice to society. I don't care if Chris confessed to the murders and carried them out all alone. If she helped him plan, or if she was an accessory to them, or an accessory after the fact, it helped them cover it up. Or by deleting her text messages with them, she destroyed evidence. I don't want her to be able to cut her hair and change her name and move across the street from some other, uh, some other family. I want her locked up. So whether she's innocent or guilty, I do believe that the investigators in this case did a big uh, disservice to everyone involved from what I've seen so far. Now, maybe this is all leading somewhere, but from what I've seen so far, these look like very sloppy basic mistakes. And in fact, the mistakes are so frequent and so egregious that it almost makes me wonder if they were just trying to uh, nip this in the bud now that they had Chris, as if it were deliberate. I think, I know why he lied to me. He lied to me because if I'd have known that he had a child on the way, I'd have never wasted my time with him in the first place. Like none of this would ever even occur if he would have just told me the truth. So do you think if he found out that you, um, if, let's say this week you guys were to go look at some apartments, and this is hypothetical, but you, um, you've you never found out that his wife was pregnant, would, would that have changed anything? Uh, like you just said, if I knew he was, his wife was pregnant, I wouldn't be in this picture. So if his wife was not pregnant... Um, and forgive me, but if, if, if he takes her out of the picture, you're never going to know that she was pregnant, right? What do you mean takes her out of the picture? Like if, if he murdered her, she's out of the picture. You're never going to know if she was pregnant. If he can get away with murder, you're not going to, I got divorced from my wife. You say, do you understand what I'm saying here? And frankly, I, I don't follow where this guy's trying to go either. Nicole already told us that if she had known Shanann was pregnant, it would have been a, a deal breaker. So it is important when Nicole found out that Shanann was pregnant. If Nicole knew beforehand, she just told us herself it would have been a big deal. Maybe she would have pushed Chris to do something dramatic. Like, you need to get rid of that baby, or... Um, who knows what she could have said, even in just the heat of an argument or uh, something less, and then how Chris interpreted it. 
but she already told us it was a big deal to her. The convoluted questions this interview is asking also displease me. Here, if, if she's gone. But this. Don't leave. Hypothetically. Please. Yeah. Don't hypothetically. If she All right, now I understand as well. So I've been fairly patient in the first two videos in this series with the interviewers, um, with this interviewer, because I figured he's probably going somewhere with this. But now that we're in the third part of the series, this is no Piers Morgan or Dr. Phil situation where um, we can kind of figure out what they're doing uh, to keep the people on board as they get to the truth. So if you've seen any of my analysis of Piers Morgan interviews or Dr. Phil, lots of people don't like them. I think that sometimes they do a terrible job and sometimes they both do a great job. It kind of just depends on the case in their case. Um, here, I haven't seen anything that looks like good technique to me. And the father being here doesn't help. So I see lots of comments of people asking why uh, Nicole... Nicole's dad was allowed to be in the interview. It's because she's cooperating. So she's not under arrest. They're, I understand that they're trying to get her to continue cooperating. If she lawyered up and went silent, everything would change. They'd stop getting info from her. Um, she asked for her dad to be there. Fair enough. If it makes her more comfortable to talk, I probably would have let him in as well. However, I would have exercised some more authority over him to shut him up. And this interview seems to be allowing everyone to walk all over him. Now, I have been told in the comments that his wife or something, or he has a podcast, I would be curious um, if he saw this video to explain what his strategy was. So I still allow for the possibility that this is a strategy. Maybe earlier on before this interview, they seemed very skittish, like they were ready to walk off and lawyer up. So he had to go very soft and and use kid gloves with them, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. So it's something worth exploring in this series, the, what the actual interview strategy was here. If she, okay. you understand where I'm going. If right, you didn't you're, know... You're leading into right. questions that are nothing with your... If you didn't know, though... Wait, Nick. That she was there. Did you hear what I said? I'm not, I'm following you. I just want her to answer a question that relates to... She said something that's important, that if he didn't have a child on the way, she, or if he didn't, if she didn't know that, she would have continued the relationship, right? But he killed his kids. It All right, so the interviewer has understood that Shanann's pregnancy was a big deal to Nicole. Maybe even a big enough deal to end the entire relationship and force Chris to do something dramatic, at least in his mind, to save it. But earlier, he asked so many poor questions about when she found out about it that he, even he is struggling to understand what the truth is. This is his fourth attempt to find out when she found out about the pregnancy. So at least he realizes its, its importance to the case, but he is ineffective at getting to the fact of the matter of when she found out. What point does he think that I'm going to be I'm not, in a relationship? I'm not talking about the children. I'm just talking specifically about her. If, if, if you only knew, if the kids were still here and he called you and said, I'm divorced from my wife, and he gets away with this, do you understand what I'm thinking from his aspect? I still wouldn't do it. I still wouldn't do it because I'd be like, where did she go? Okay. Because I'm under the impression that she's a really good mom. Like, he never bashed her mom in skills. Like, he... No. No. I wouldn't... No. Okay. No. And that's... that. You see where I'm trying to take that? Yes. So, he never... You guys never had a conversation about the child, period. I didn't... All right. Another bad question. You guys never had a conversation about the child, period. Another loaded question. If you are trying to get someone to tell you the truth, right? You're trying to get to the truth and make it hard for them to lie and make it easy for them to respond honestly, you do not ask loaded questions. 
Did he ever tell you about the pregnancy? Did you guys ever have a conversation about pregnancy? Those are better ways to ask the question. Now, sometimes, let's say, uh, uh, let's say you're questioning someone on, you know, with an agenda, right? You want to make them look bad. Then you ask loaded questions. So, for example, if they were pursuing her hard, we could expect them to say, well, he told you about the baby, didn't he? Or they could even bluff, right? We have him in the other room. He told us the baby was a big issue to you, wasn't it? So when police ask loaded questions of a suspect, typically they're asking it in the affirmative. He's asking these in the negative. If you're interviewing a job candidate, don't ask a loaded question in affirmative or negative. You want to get to the truth. You're not trying to pin something on someone. Or for example, in in my uh, example with the sandwich, let's say I really don't like that person. I really think they took my sandwich. Then I might ask a loaded question, but it would of course be in the affirmative. You took my sandwich, didn't you? You just had break, right? Did you take my sandwich? Something along those lines. I didn't know at all. All right. All right. So let's rewind. I'm trying to take that. Yes. So he never, you guys never had a conversation about the child, period. You guys never had a conversation about the child, period. If I'm telling the truth, I would say never. And if I'm lying, I would say never. What does Nicole say? I didn't know at all. All I didn't know at all. What did she do? She didn't answer the question. The question was, did you have a conversation about the child? She gave a non-responsive answer. She said, I didn't know. The question was not whether or not she knew of the baby. It was if they had a conversation about the child. In a courtroom, that wouldn't fly. With this investigator, however, it apparently does. The other thing to note here is she said, I didn't know ever. What is ever? It's an intensifier. And if you have a copy of the Deception Deck, which is my 52 favorite rules for spotting lies and manipulation, uh, drop it in the chat. Let me know that you spotted that yourself. For everyone else, I will read the rule about intensifiers so you can see how it applies to Nicole's response here. So ever is an intensifying adverb. Each card in the Deception Deck has a different rule. The rule is on the back so you can practice like a flashcard to memorize it. And it also has an example. So I'm going to read you the rule about intensifiers. Remember, he asked if they ever had a conversation about the child. She A, gave a non-responsive answer. She said, I didn't know, which wasn't the question. And then she said, ever. Words such as very, really, totally, and super, and ever are often used for persuasion. Liars frequently employ these terms unprompted, reflecting their insecurity about the believability of their statements. However, it's important to note that if these words are used in response to direct accusations, as in, I already told you I really am innocent, their usage can be considered appropriate. In other words, Nicole had no reason to say the word ever. She was actually being asked the question in the negative. She wasn't even being accused of having a conversation, which suggests that she probably felt insecure about her answer because she knows she's lying. So intensifying adverbs used unprompted are a great indicator of deception. Like, I didn't skip class, mom. Really, I swear. Or I was super early to class every day last week. I was never tardy. That person needs to be looked into more if they're not being accused of being late to class. All right. And by your words, if you did know, you would have ended the relationship. Well, because it wouldn't have made sense to me that he's like, I'm getting separated. Oh, by the way, I have a baby on the way. It's like, you are a liar. You're just trying to sleep with me. That's what I would have probably interpreted that as. And I'd have just shut that off at work. And that would have been the end of it. Okay. Um, all right, we can move past that. Um, the week that he comes back from North Carolina, 
you, you don't remember, somewhere in the first couple of weeks of August. Yeah, I think it was the second week, but I don't remember off the top of my head. So we'll just use August as a time frame. Is that fair? Because you know he left in July and he comes back in August. How many times do you think you see him? I saw him a few times. I saw him this past Saturday. I saw him the Wednesday before that. And he wanted to see me more. I was the one who wanted my space. I was like, nope. Your kids are home. Go hang out with your kids. All right, so this is also interesting. Lots of times we get little hints at the pressures she applied to Chris to leave his family. So as I said, I don't think she helped him plan or carry out or cover up the murder so far from what I've seen. However, I do think she's deceptive, as I just pointed out. I think she knew Shanann was pregnant um, before she said she did. It probably led to lots of fights. It probably led to their ultimatum. An ultimatum that I think she gave him while he was in North Carolina. But you can also see here, we saw this in part uh, two of my series. In my video, Manipulated into Murder. Where she said, well, you know, he wanted to see me more. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to see him every day. Go spend time with your kids. So as she talks, she leaks the sort of tactics she used to manipulate him. What did she leak there? That she was punishing him for spending time with his, his kids. Right? I'm not going to hang out with you. I'm not sleeping with you. Go hang out with your kids. You keep talking about your kids. You want to see your kids and do all this stuff with your kids. Well, go hang out with your kids. Right? That's almost the tone she used when she's telling the police about this. Right? So as she's trying to soften it for the police, she gives us a clue to the tone of how she's saying these things. And manipulators will often do this where they tell you the exact truth, but they leave out the tone and the context. And in my Jada Pinkett Smith series, we've seen her do this a thousand times in interviews, where if she quotes herself word for word, it sounds fine. But if you apply the mocking, belittling uh, tone she probably used with Will, the context completely changes. So here in part two, we deduced that she is probably very jealous of Chris. Nicole appeared to have punished Chris for spending time with his children instead of her. For example, saying that when he was with his kids, he needed to be alone with them. In other words, pick them between them and her. And here she did it again. When was he alone? When he needed to go be with his kids. Last Saturday, I saw him the Wednesday before that. And he wanted to see me more. I was the one who wanted my... Right, he wanted to see her more. So it's not like they're both saying, hey, let's uh, take some time apart. I'll go spend time with my kids. You know, you, you go do whatever you want to do. Go to the gym. He wanted to see her and she said no. And then she reveals to us why she said no. Out of my space. I was like, nope, your kids are home. Go hang out with your kids. Right, nope, your kids are home. Go hang out with your kids. Since we're an hour and 15 minutes into this interview, she's starting to let the tone that she actually uses with Chris slip, right? So she repeated that, recited it, probably the way she actually said to Chris, right? Can we hang out tonight? Nope. Go spend time with your kids. Go spend time with those kids you love so much. She's starting to wear down a little bit. Earlier in the interview, she really softened it up, right? She said stuff like, almost like she was a marriage counselor. Well, I told him that he should really spend time with his kids uh, because he's such a great father. So, you know, go see what your kids are doing. Make sure they're okay. Even back then, though, as she was buttering it up, we deduced what it really meant. She was being manipulative. She was trying to make her actual words sound better than they actually were. What was this when she was telling him to go spend time with his kids? It was a punishment. Probably for not giving her enough attention or not being available when she wanted him to be available because his wife and children were around. Something along those lines. And even on Wednesday, I cut it short. Like he came and hang out with me for a few hours. Once again, I cut it short. Not that Chris cut it short or that we cut it short. Typically when people are in a couple, they say we. We went to Six Flags. We left the, the movie early because it was boring. Not I cut the movie short even though he wanted to stay. Hours, and then I was like, go chill with your kids. 
Um, I was always like, really do you know specifically where you guys? Right, and then then now she's realizing probably that she's leaking a little bit too much of of the tone that she used with Chris. Right, I was really respectful with his kids, of his kids. That's not what it sounds like. It sounds like she was belittling his relationship with his kids and using it against him to punish him. That's what it really sounds like. Of course, even if you agree with everything I'm saying about how manipulative and unlikable she is, we all must understand that that does not mean she's a murderer. It doesn't mean she encouraged him to kill his family. It doesn't mean he encour she encouraged him to um, do anything dramatic. Now, would they? Might they have joked about it on some app where she, you know, that she hid from us? Yes, or in those text messages that she deleted? Yeah. But so far, I haven't seen any evidence that she has guilty knowledge about how the family died, or or um, yeah, in the planning stages or how it would have been covered up. Guys, when did you meet at your house? Did you guys go to uh, um, any restaurants? Did you go to establishments? Where'd you go? Last. Wednesday, he came to my house, and this past Saturday, we went to, um, what's the name of that bar that we used to go to? It's not the same, the Lazy Dog, but it's the one off of 144th and I-25. I think it's 144th, up there. And it's the Lazy Dog? Yes. Um, did he ever mention a Rockies game that night? Um, no, I don't think so, but there was a... It was, uh, um, the Broncos were playing. Okay. Which we couldn't see because they sat us in a crappy spot. So it's okay because it's preseason. <laughs> but, um. So you went, do you recall what time you went there? Mm, no. I remember, well, kind of. So he had to get a babysitter that night. Do you know who that was? Uh, somebody who's really young. I remember I asked him who his babysitter was. And he's like, we have two. This girl's only 17. But the other one's out of town, so this girl's going to stay, and she doesn't do overnights, so i got to be back by 10. And okay. I remember her saying that, and him saying that. And I I don't know what time he got to my house. It was between, I want to say like 5.30. It might have been 5, but I don't think so, because I think the babysitter, if I remember correctly, showed up at like 4.30 or something, and he was like, I want to spend time getting my kids acclimated to her, and then I will come. So her ch his children didn't even know her. Oh, no, they knew her, but he was saying, like, he likes to, like, stay there for a little while. while he doesn't just, like, walk out the door when okay. they show up. It's, like, a transitional thing. And so um, that's why I'm saying I don't know how long it was. I want to say, like, 5.30. And then he had to be back by 10, so he left at, like, 9-something to be back by 10. So, so he picked like, you up? What was he driving? No, he didn't pick me up. He came to my house. We drove my truck. Okay. So you, he gets to your house. you know what he was driving to get to your house? Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember. Um, I'm pretty sure he usually drives that Lexus. That Lexus. So I've skipped over, uh, maybe like 10 minutes just because they're fairly slow, uh, earlier between part two and in this video, part three of my Nicole Kessinger an analysis. But it is interesting that whenever she refers to something that belonged or were you was used by Shanann, she refers to it as that. So that Lexus. Earlier she said the Lexus was picked and bought by Shanann. And Silver Spoon on the forum has a great list, right? So that house, those two, that thing, those guys, the couple. That, 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 whenever it comes to Shanann. Even Shanann's Lexus that Chris was driving is that. Instead of his Lexus, for example are the Lexus. Why is that? It's a little bit, it reveals a little bit of her attitude towards Shanann, I think. And this is also in the deception deck. This versus that. The word this often suggests emotional closeness in contrast to that. Liars sometimes misuse this, revealing a closeness that typically wouldn't exist if the story were true. In other words, if I say that kid, it means the kid's over there and I might not actually like that kid. Whereas if I say this kid, it means they're close to me and I probably like them. 
In other words, the fact that Nicole always says that when referring to, even earlier, she referred to Shanann's job in one of the segments that I skipped. Um, she said, like, she's a sales rep, or I don't really know what to call that. Instead of, I don't know what to call her, or I don't know what the title is um, for the job she does, or, or a- any neutral language indicates some distance between her and Shanann, which, of course, we can expect. She is cheating with Shanann's husband on Shanann. So I doubt that she particularly likes her. So we shouldn't read into it too much, but it is a good opportunity for me to get that rule out there so you guys can have it in your toolbox. But he doesn't always park it in my complex because the parking, there's not good spaces. So where you guys pick me up at, a lot of times he'll just park out there because there's room. Okay. Um, so that kind of works so that he's, because there's just not a lot of room in my apartment complex. Um, but off the top of my head, I don't know what he was driving. What kind of truck do you drive? I drive a uh, Toyota 4Runner. Okay. So you guys take your 4Runner to the Lazy Dog. Yep. And you said they sat you in crappy locations. Yeah, where, where, where were you inside we the were, When you walk in, you just hang a right. And we were like one of the first two booths on the right when you walk in the door. You okay. just It's just not a good, it's a good spot, but just not for the TVs. And we actually went to the other Lazy Dog. We went to the one that you and me go to. Where's that at? Federal and 120th. It's 120th and Federal. And we went there and they have a different menu. And I was like, I don't want to eat this food. So we should go to the other one. So initially you go to the 120th yes. location. Did and you actually get seated? Uh, kind of, sort of. They were like cleaning off a table and we were standing there just kind of looking at the beer menu and the food menu. And I was like, I don't want this. And so we Six left. Six o'clock? Probably somewhere around there, 6, 6.30. And then we left and went to the other one and we ate dinner. And you're in that first or second booth, right oh. to the right of the door. Uh-huh. I'm just asking because if they have video, we want to be able to verify that. Uh-huh. So that's why it's important. Uh-huh. Um, and you're there for how long? Uh, I don't know. Probably we didn't stay for dessert. So I don't know. How long does a restaurant take? Like an hour and a half? And I've um, never been to the Lazy Dog. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Probably about an hour and a half. And then uh, we went back to my house for a little bit. Hung out at my house um, for a little while. And then he had to leave. And then he left. Do you recall what time he left? I was out of my head. No. I remember he was, like, going to be late to be back at 10. I think there's a text message where he starts texting me when he's home at his house. Okay. So you can probably figure that out. And I remember I texted him back, and I was like, damn, that was quick. Or, wow, that was really quick. He's like, yeah, I even had time to stop at the ATM or stop at the gas station. Stop somewhere to get money to pay the babysitter. Okay. Um, And I was just, like, thinking, like, all right, so I, I don't know what the significance of the lazy dog is. Like, is something supposed to have happened? Uh, if you know, please let me know in the comments or in the forum why this, why they're asking so many questions about what they did that night. Um, because I don't think this trip to the lazy dog was any time around the murders, was it? So... If, if someone lets me know that this is really important, we can deep dive into it. But so far, it just sounds like one of her, you know, vague uh, responses, right? So she's probably telling the truth, but she self edits a lot and she uses lots of uh, words to sort of minimize uh, details as she edits things that she doesn't think are important. I'm like, well, that was really fast. Um, but I think he was still like a little late coming back, but nothing too drastic. So he probably left my house like somewhere around 930. In fact, there's a good post in the uh, DD forum about this by Carrie Berry. So she watched this section of the interview and she correctly notes that Nicole uses lots of perception qualifiers. Like to be honest with you, she uses lots of intensifying adverbs like like I pointed out earlier, where she says, super cute, so cute, really want to help you. Distancing language like that house, those guys, the couple. And um, yeah, a bunch of reticence about stories where she doesn't want to be fully candid. And like me, Carrie Berry also does not think that she's involved on the uh, in the murders despite all this, right? So people can speak this way. For lots of different reasons. For example, Nicole has reason to want to guard some information. She was 
cheating with a guy who murdered his family. Also, she probably encouraged him. Well, we, I, I think we see enough evidence that she encouraged him to leave his family. They might have joked about killing his family on other uh, chat tools. Um, but I still don't see a murderer here. 30-ish. All right. And you know, you go straight home. He texts you. Um, well, I was already home. Right. No, he texts you. He goes straight home from your house, and he texts you that he's home. Mm -hmm. So that should be in your text message. It, it should be. I'm pretty positive that was not a phone call. I'm almost positive that was a text. Sometimes I get them flip-flopped, or I don't remember, but sometimes I know. I'm pretty sure that one was a text. Saturday. So it's interesting that she conf she says she confuses texts and phone calls. Could that be true? Maybe. Um, I don't think I've ever confused a conversation I had on the phone for one I had on a text message. But that's just me. She could be telling the truth. But if she is lying here, this might be a, sm a slight indication that they were using other messaging apps as I think they were. Ever since my first analysis in the series, I have noted how she's worked very hard to dance around mentioning other apps as a potential uh, communication method between her and Chris. So when she says, I can't remember whether or not that was a text message or a phone call, she might be self-editing because she can't remember if it was actually a text message or something they sent on some other encrypted tool they used when they were talking to each other. Right? Even if you're not helping someone plan a murder, if you're cheating on your spouse, chances are you're using some other app to communicate um, with your lover besides your text messages. You don't want something popping up on your phone while you're having dinner with your wife. Saturday during your dinner, um, what, what kind of conversation did you guys have? I, I don't even remember. Oh, I, uh, so... He's been trying to like eat a little healthier than he normally does. And he's always like been in the working out since I knew him and he like tries to eat clean, but he was trying to like step it up a little bit and nothing like the people who do like the competitions and the shows that are all super restrictive. And it was nothing like that. It's just like day to day general maintenance, but it's how I eat and it's pretty healthy. And, um, he's been losing a lot of weight. He lost. I want to say like 13 pounds in the time that we were hanging out. And honestly, when you start eating a little bit cleaner and you start What is this called? If you've been on my channel for a while, we haven't seen this in a while. We saw this with the early bodybuilders I used to analyze, the ones who said they weren't taking steroids. This is a tangent. So notice how Nicole's answers before were sort of reticent, sort of vague, fairly short. Now when she's asked what she and Chris spoke about at the Lazy Dog, we're getting a big answer that goes off what we were talking about, macronutrients. And he's not a bodybuilder, but he's doing this and that. To me, this looks like a tangent. It looks like she's filibustering to avoid telling us what they talked about. So maybe at one point they did talk about macronutrients because 99% of the time, if someone's lying to you, they will omit information. So they will tell the truth. So maybe while they were browsing the menus at the Lazy Dog, they discussed the calorie counts of what they were going to order. But is that the only thing they spoke about for an hour and a half? I doubt it. But she's telling us this conversation. She started micronutrients. Now she's telling us a whole history of well, he was dieting, but he wasn't a bodybuilder. Let's see how long she goes on for. Remember, this is likely not the only thing they spoke about at dinner. How often have you been to a dinner and you only talk about one topic? Also, notice how quickly she started off talking about macronutrients, but now she's branched out into talking about fitness in general. This should be a red flag to the investigators. If someone does this with you, where you ask them a potentially sensitive question, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they start giving you a long, rambling, highly detailed response, let them finish 
and then circle back. So we'll see if he does that. Let her finish. Okay, so you discussed background nutrients. Great. What else did you talk about? And maybe she'll go on another tangent. Well, we discussed the, the waitress. She had a funny haircut and we were talking about that. Let her go on her tangent. Okay, what else did you talk about? Until they can bring themselves to say, we didn't talk about anything else. Or I don't remember. In other words, this looks like a tangent, and tangents are sometimes hard to notice. All right, so let's listen. In the shows that are all super restrictive, and there's nothing like that. It's just like... Saturday, during your dinner, um, what, what kind of conversation did you guys have? I don't, I don't even remember. Oh, I... Uh, so... He's been trying to like eat a little healthier than he normally does. And he's always like been in the working out since I knew him. Actually, this is even weaker than I said. He said, what sort of conversation did you have? And she's telling us, well, he's been into working out. So far, this is non-responsive. So she hasn't even brought herself to say that that's what they talked about. She's telling us a general fact about Chris, that he's been working on his health. That doesn't answer the question about what they spoke about at the Lazy Dog. So maybe there is a reason that the lazy dog is important. Maybe that's where, if there was a, a plan hatched up between them, that's where it happened, or a big falling out, or a big final fight in ultimatum between them, that's where it happened. Um, but as always, I don't want to learn too many details about the case as I analyze it. Otherwise, it will bias my analysis. So as far as I can tell right now, she is sensitive about talking about the conversation they had at Lazy Dog. Him and he like tries to eat clean, but he was trying to like step it up a little bit. And nothing like the people who do like the competitions and the shows that are all super restrictive. And it was nothing like that. It's just like day to day general maintenance. But it's how I eat, and it's pretty healthy. And all right, so she was asked what the conversation they had was like at the Salty Dog. And now we're hearing about how Chris is trying to lose weight and how she's trying to lose weight, but they're not bodybuilders. And uh, a more tangential ran um, rambling information. This is a classic tangent. And um, he's been losing a lot of weight. He lost, I want to say like 13 pounds in the time that we were hanging out. And Honestly, when you start eating a little bit cleaner and you start working out a little bit harder the first couple months, especially for a man because they lose weight faster, it's not something that's like that drastic to me, but it did stand out that it was like a little much. And so I was like, whoa, like maybe you're not eating enough macronutrients. So let me look at them. So he had been working on his My Fitness Pal app and like, programming like all the stuff he eats and I just started going through them and I was like trying to figure out like where his ratios were and we actually spent a lot of time doing that because he'd asked me to remember this is a response to what they talked about at the lazy dog this has been going on for like a minute now if someone tries to do this to you let them talk let them ramble but you need to circle back that's great he was trying to lose weight. It's great you helped him with his My Fitness app. But that doesn't tell me what you talked about at the Lazy Dog that night. So besides macronutrients, and she hasn't even said that's what they were talking about. She hasn't even said this was actually their discussion. So besides macronutrients, what else did you two talk about at Lazy Dog? Asked me to do it for him. Um, because I just was at the point where I was like, if his weight loss slows down in a few weeks... It'll be fine. And if it doesn't, then his macros are a little off. It's not like that big of a deal. Like in the workout community, this is like a very normal thing. But Did I you just, have any other outside concerns like potential drug use, alcohol use, any of that stuff that that led you to go, oh, he's lost an extreme amount of weight in such a short period of time? So this is a major turning point in this interview. And it tells us that the investigator likely does not know what he's doing. She just went on a rambling tangent about helping Chris with his macronutrients and 
how they were losing weight, but they're not bodybuilders in her own diet. All in response to what were they talking about at the Lazy Dog? We still don't have an answer to what they spoke about at the Lazy Dog that night. And now we have the investigator, instead of letting her finish and circling back to say, well, what else did you talk about at the Lazy Dog? Ask a follow-up question to her tangent. This is a mistake you should never make in your own life. If someone starts giving you a non-responsive answer and going down all these paths, let them finish, but bring them back on track. Don't forget your original question. And this isn't the only mistake we've seen him make so far in this video. We've seen him ask loaded questions. We've seen him ask questions that even if they were answered honestly, wouldn't get us to the truth. So there are lots of lessons to learn in this video. And we've seen them beginning, middle, and end throughout. So as far as I'm concerned, neither of these people have the benefit of the doubt anymore. And since we're coming up on an hour, I'll wrap it up here. On your screen right now is a video I recommend you watch, as well as my Nicole Kessinger playlist if you want to see the other parts of this series. Until next time, stay true.